So yesterday. Oh yeah, and the kids. Um, thank you. This one's beyond. Yeah. yeah. So yesterday we had a. Um, I was talking to um, Brother Mears and a couple other brothers, Brother Joseph. We had an apostolic evening yesterday. It was preaching into the night. We had people falling asleep. We had people passing out. <laughs> we had people taking nose dives off the pew, hitting one of those benches, and having lacerations. So um, it, it was interesting. Uh, but praise God, everybody survived through the night. <laughs> and to top it off, we had a, 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 a in the dark capture the flag. So <laughs> it was. It was Praise the Lord, we're all here, and uh, God is so good to us. Amen. Um, that, that song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to lead the God I love. Take my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for the courts above. Yes. What a powerful, powerful words, yeah. um, truly. Um, I would like us to uh, open to Jeremiah uh, chapter 18 and take a look at the first six verses of Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1 through 6. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. It's interesting that there are some interesting analogies in Scripture, some intimate analogies in Scripture of the relationship each one of us as believers have with God. Can we just have a few people call out those interesting analogies? I'll give you the first one, Father and Son, mm -hmm. which is literal. It's not even an analogy. It's literal. We, we, he is our Father, and we are His children. What other ones do we remember? In scripture. King and bond servant. King and bond servant. A friend is sticks closer than a brother. A friend is close, sticks closer than a brother. Marriage. Marriage. Yes. A bride and groom. A bride and groom. Mm -hmm. Bond slave. A bond slave. Vine and branches. Vine and branches. Shepherd and sheep. Shepherd and sheep. Creator and creation. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, I think, that all of us here, and we can name more and more and more. The scripture is full of these things. Um, but I think every one of us has a specific one that we personally enjoy. Uh, there are a few things that strike at our hearts. And I think Isaiah speaks to some of the things that he's seen. And he speaks in Isaiah, if you open to chapter 64. Uh, verse 8, he calls out um, Isaiah 64, verse 8, and he says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are thy, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. So there is a father and a potter in the same verse. And both, to me, are very intimate. Because we all know what it is to have a father, and some of us know what it is not to have a father. But we all have an inner desire to be loved, to be parented, to be mentored, to be fathered. Mm -hmm. And we all have an intimate desire to be dealt with, to be taken care of. And it's interesting that the potter has a very intimate relationship with the clay. He puts his hands on the clay. He doesn't take his hands off the clay until the work is finished. There's a very close relationship there. And it's interesting that Jeremiah, when he goes to the potter's house, God begins to deal and cause him to hear the words of the Lord. We see the theme of this divine potter and the clay running all through Scripture. 
Because when we see in Genesis 2, 7, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Mm. So you see that clay, you see that, the, the dust, the, the particles of this universe, you know, God creating a soul and, and life. We see that we are literally clay in the hands of the potter when Paul in Acts 17, 28 says, in him we live and move and have our being. And then we see that he speaks in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. We have this treasure when he refers to this glorious knowledge of Jesus Christ in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So there's this treasure that we contain in earthen vessels. And it's interesting that the Lord has Jeremiah go to the potter's house to be able to see, visualize, and to there, as he's visualizing the work of the potter, to hear the word of the Lord, not only to his own heart, but to be able to speak it to the nation Israel. I'd like to ask, just a show of hands, who's ever um, done pottery? Maybe in high school, in college? Okay. This is going to be preaching to the choir here. <laughs> so, um, great. We will be able to connect more um, with the truths of God's Word here because you've experienced what it is to shape clay. Um, it wasn't, uh, we had an experience uh, with my wife. We just went out once um, to, to do some pottery together. And um, that was uh, an interesting experience. I really enjoyed that. But before we went, we watched this presentation. If you haven't seen it, it's on uh, YouTube. It's by Pastor Pat Lazovich. Um, but he, uh, while he's shaping this beautiful pot, he's speaking about biblical truths. And um, before we went, we watched that because we wanted to see how he's going to do it so that we can do it in a similar way. And I've made mistakes. When we came, he had a big thing of clay. We had a small piece because they were saving money, I guess. So we were supposed to make a, a, a bowl. He was making a pot, right? I thought I could make that pot out <laughs> of this much clay. So I was trying to lift the edges and do the right thing, and it was just breaking in my hands, and the only thing that survived was what my wife made. So, um, and it was a little thing for like a few nuts or candies, you know, just a little bit little there. So when we came, um, we had a little perspective of what we are to do. But the beautiful picture of a potter working with clay um, is there's a few things that have to go right. And the first thing is that, we, we'll get into it more later, but just in, in, in essence, the first thing is that before we got the clay, the, the lady that hosted this event, she had to take the clay and she had to beat it. She had to beat it with a stick then beat it with her hand. And the reason they have to take this unformed lump of clay and, and, and beat it and be brutal with it. Some people say, I mean, it does not look good when you take out some clay and, the, and then you just start smashing and smashing and smashing and it's like, what are you doing? It doesn't feel like an intimate relationship at that point, you know? You are just smashing the daylights out of that clay. But the reason you're doing it is because all those air bubbles that are in the clay have to be removed, ex removed from, extracted from the clay, so that when the vessel is ready and it's pulled, pulled into the, put into the kiln, and the temperatures are high, you don't have a ruin. It doesn't crack, it doesn't burst, it doesn't shatter under the high temperatures, because if that air bubble starts popping up, it'll burst the whole thing. The other lesson we learned uh, on our end of the experience is that you have to put that thing in the center of the wheel. <laughs> and I've tried to put it not in the center of the wheel. Well, I, I put it in the center of the wheel. I thought it was in the center of the wheel. It was in the center of the wheel. And they say the real, the real potter, he, he knows when it's in the center. It looked in the center. It was everything was in the center. But then it started doing this when it started coming up. And that's not, that's not going anywhere. But to me, it was in the center. So first you have to center the clay, and there's a lot that can preach there, is you cannot live life in your own balance. You cannot go and be in a different place. You have to be centered on God. That's the only way you can raise up to be any kind of vessel useful for God's word. 
So it has to be centered on God. The other thing is that the way you apply pressure to the clay, there's, there's a technique, and it requires a lot of water. So who have, here has used less water than they should have used while doing pottery? Who's used too much? Okay. So, when, yes, you make soup. <laughs> you know, and things start splashing a lot off the wheel. But really, um, using just enough water to be able to keep it moist and to be able to raise that, that, that vessel up and to be able to do what you want to do with it is very important. And there's so many scriptural analogies to that. That life, we cannot live life, we cannot go from day to day without abiding and soaking our mind in the Word of God. Right. Even before it gets to the wheel, the, the, the clay has to sit in a bucket of water to soak in the moisture for sometimes hours, sometimes days. Mm-hmm. Usually days. So that it's ready and pliable, ready to be worked with. And there's so much that can be translated into personal life of how my mind needs to be in the Word of God. Mm-hmm. And then when God is doing and working, if I'm not allowing the Word of God, the refreshing of God's Word in a day, on a daily basis, there sh- tearing happens, mm-hmm. chattering happens. God has to put everything back into the same lump of clay and begin again. So it's interesting about this passage in Jeremiah 18 is that by this time, the nation Israel had about 800 years to look back on. Even when Christ came later, they would look back and they would say, we are the children of Abraham. They would regard Moses. So in a sense, God began to work with his people, not just with the patriarchs, but with his people as a whole, when he took them out of Egypt. And proverbially, or in an allegorical way, we can see God taking this lump of clay and throwing it on the wheel and begin to do something with that vessel. So they look back and they see already 800 years have passed. There's a history there. There's a certain form. There's a certain vessel that is created. They have a background. They have a heritage. And I think in many of their minds, even though they were going against God and falling away from God, in their minds, they did not think God would scrap them. That God would start all over. That God would put the clay back together and then build something new and build something different. They weren't expecting that. And yet, in this passage, God caused Jeremiah to hear. Later, we see in verse 7, he says, At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning the kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, and if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So again, verse 6, O house of Israel, can I, I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. So it's never a pleasant experience if you've on a personal level, been with the Lord for 20, 30 years, and then God has to start all over. It hadn't been a pleasant experience for the nation of Israel to go for 800 years, and then God saying, I'm going to start all over, I'm going to build something new. Mm. I'm going to build something different. It wasn't in their minds, it wasn't in their heart, they didn't, they didn't expect this, but it came to, as a shock to them, even though they were rebels against God, many of them were. It's a beautiful experience, those who have made vessels of clay, to see this worthless lump of clay, really lifeless, there's no beauty, there's nothing there, and to see it become this beautiful vessel. And many times, if you look at a professional, when he's working a matter of minutes, he's got this beautiful clay, and sometimes he'll drop the edge, and the, there's a lip that forms, and it's just, it's just an amazing experience, and they'll put art on it and design it. and it's, it's, it's great to see. If you haven't, please look into it. However, it is a disturbing sight to see a beautiful vessel fall, fall apart in the hands of a potter. Yeah. It's like when something's going wrong, either the speed is too fast or um, not enough water, and then that beautiful thing just, you, you almost like, you get shocked by it, like it tears, it, 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 sometimes it flies out, sometimes it, 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 things can happen, and it doesn't look good. At that point, that beautiful vessel becomes marred. And this is what Jeremiah saw. He saw this, this clay marred, 
in the hand of the potter. And so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. I see the great warning, I think we all see here, great warning to Israel that unless they repent, he will allow them to fall apart like this vessel in the potter's hand. And he will make something new. So there's a warning and then there's a promise too. Because we see a lot of prophecy dealing with the restoration, dealing with their hearts, dealing with when I bring you back from your land of captivity that you will be a different people. And they were. In, many, in, many, in, a, in a great sense, they were. And we know that this is exactly what happened. God humbled his people who were proud, who did not heed God's warning, who didn't want to hear Jeremiah, who didn't want to uh, repent for their sins. We know that they went into Babylonian captivity, that King Nebuchadnezzar came and, and destroyed them. And this, 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 this vessel in the hands of the potter was marred in a sense. But today I would like us to, with this thought in mind, Go back to the beginnings when God took the nation Israel out of Egypt. And as it were, threw them on that wheel and began to shape and to form them. And to take a look together and to see what is God's method as a potter? How does he apply pressure? What does he use in this process of making a vessel for his use? How, how does he work with the clay? How does he experience and how do we experience that? And how do we relate to that? So to look at that, let's look to, uh, to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And we'll read verse uh, verses 1 through 6. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thy heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. So it's interesting that in Scripture, when God begins to deal with a man or a woman, oftentimes we see that he takes them to the wilderness or to the backside of the desert. And they go through something very challenging and very difficult. But just in our group here, how many wilderness experiences do we have in Scripture that are recorded for us? How many experiences where people went into the wilderness and came out of the wilderness, out of this place of pressure, out of this place of working as different men, different women? Any, any, a few here from, from, from Scripture. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Moses. Moses. Christ. 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 Elijah. Elijah. Mm -hmm. Paul. Paul. Mm -hmm. Paul. Mm -hmm. yeah. Joseph. Joseph. Everybody. Everybody. <laughs> so there's a pattern and there's a theme that it's amazing. The wilderness is a special place that God has. But if we were just to take a look at the wilderness, it's not a beautiful place. It's not a place any one of us want to go when we're thinking about vacation. Maybe. <laughs> Brother Mike. So it's it's a place where it's 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 stressful and it's challenging and it's it's it, it'll push you to your limits. Ooh, yeah, baby. The one of my favorite stories that I've, I've not meditated on or developed, um, but the story of Hagar who ran away um, from Sarah, who was dealing harshly with her, and just the story of her seeing God in the wilderness, and then. 
coming out of that wilderness, going back with the understanding and knowledge that there's a God that sees her. Mm. It's just such a beautiful thing to me that sometimes, even when in my life and previous just experience looking back when I felt like I was running away from God or, or isolating myself from God, yet in those experiences, God revealed himself as I'm a God who sees you. Mm. I'm a God who knows you. Yes. Like I'm a God who knows where you're at right now, and I'm not one judging you. I'll give you direction. I'll give you guidance. Go back. Do the right. Do the things that I want you to do, but I'm, I'm actually seeing you. I know who you are. Mm. It's a beautiful thing. Mm. Our God is an amazing God. He's such a tender, loving God, and yet he's firm and he's stern. He, he has things that he's wanting to accomplish in the life of believers. So it is in the backside of the desert, as we mentioned, Moses, he encounters God in a burning bush after 40 years of wandering. It's amazing that when Moses thought he was ready to be used of God, he wasn't. And when he knew he wasn't, he was. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, we see David running and hiding from King Saul in the wilderness for most of his young adult years. And some of his most beautiful psalms were penned in the wilderness. And it's arguable that it was the, at the lowest point of his existence that God gave him the kingdom. I still don't know all of the what was David doing in, in that land of wandering, and then when he came back, God gave him the king. But he was at the lowest point of this wilderness experience, of his own spiritual and physical wilderness experience, where he had to find and seek God. And then we already mentioned the greatest men of all, Jesus Christ, the God-man, who being led by the Spirit into the wilderness after his baptism, he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit out of that wilderness. He did what nation Israel could not do for 40 days and 40 nights. He quoted Deuteronomy 8. He quoted that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. I believe this verse means that it's there's more to it. There's a depth to it. But part of it is that there's satisfaction and nothing else but the word of God and the, the, the living out of his commandments, the doing of his word and his will. And that's life, true life, that a person can experience here on earth. So in a sense, the wilderness is God's chosen place for forming, for testing, for bringing through the fire the vessels that he chooses to use for his glory and his service. But what kind of place is this wilderness? Like when we think about the wilderness, what kind of place is the wilderness? And it's a place of isolation. It's a place of need. It's a place of intense pressure. When it's hot in the day, when it's cold in the night, there's a lot of pressure. There's a place of emptying. It's a place where you can look at your water flask and not find any more water in it. It's a place of emptying. It's a place of pain. You don't have medical facilities all over the wilderness or in the desert. Not a lot of them. It's a place of waiting. For Israel, is a place of wandering. And I think a lot of these truths, they, we can relate with. Because maybe somebody even here today is experiencing isolation. We are in a loving family. And we are grateful to be in a loving family of God. But maybe even in a loving family of God, some people are experiencing isolation. Maybe there's deep spiritual or physical needs that somebody keeps to themselves that they don't want to share or don't want to have help with, or there are barriers to that. It could be that somebody is experiencing pressure from outside, whether it's financial, whether whatever it may be, or from within. We talked a lot about parenting. There's a, there are a lot of mothers in this room and fathers, and there also could be a lot of pressure in the home. Could there be pain in somebody's life or waiting on the Lord? 
for something. And does anybody ever felt in their life the point where they're wandering with no end in sight? If, if you're in that place right now, if there are those experiences, um, that, that would qualify for a wilderness experience. Mm. And there is a purpose to that wilderness experience. Amen. It's not, God does not waste time. God does not waste pain. God does not waste hurt. That's right. There is a great purpose for the wilderness experience. He had placed you there. So if I'm a child of God and I find myself in the wilderness, it is no reason to panic or to fear. Mm. The, the most comforting thought is that the nail-pierced hands of Christ are shaping you in that wilderness. Mm. He's the one that's holding you and me in the wilderness experience, and he's doing a work. Working on a vessel. Amen. Applying pressure in the right areas, adding enough water at the right time, using the right speed of the wheel to turn. And sometimes it feels like it's going, it's turning too fast. Lord, stop the wheel. I'm getting off of this wheel. Like, I don't want this to go that fast. My goal is so many RPMs. I'm not going that fast. Like, that's too much water, God. I don't need that much water. You know, I'm falling asleep in jury, whatever it may be. You know, it's like, God, but he's doing something. It's like if it's going too fast, it's, it's, it's by his in, intention. He's, he's working. He's designing something. Maybe somebody thinks it's going too slow. Speed it up, Lord. And the Lord knows exactly what he's doing. Because he's not in it to destroy us. He's in it to build us. To create vessels, not for our own glory, but for his glory, so that he can fill us and empty us and fill us and empty us. Because there's nothing in us that is of any good. It's only him, truly. We are vessels in the hands of an amazing potter. And it's his purposes that he is after, but also for our benefit and our good, for his glory. So what is God's purpose of the, for the wilderness experience? We read in verse 2 of Deuteronomy 8, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness. And we see these two purposes, to humble thee and to prove thee. Mm -hmm. So to humble thee and to prove thee. To prove is to test. To know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee. And suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with man, and which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So in God's service, there are no vessels stained with pride. He's not going to take a vessel and employ it to his use if it has pride. So what he does in the nation of Israel or in an individual life, as an example, we see it here, is he first begins to humble. And that humbling we already talked about is this beating experience. Like, I like the picture of a potter holding in his hands this clay, like being so close, it's, they're connected. He's holding this clay and he's forming it. It doesn't seem to be a, a, a comforting picture when you see that same potter first beating the clay. But it, but it needs to be done. And it's both experiences are God's experiences. So he is first humbling. It's interesting that in Psalm 25, 9, it says, The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. And then this passage that I love, it's such a, so dear to my heart, Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. And the word contrite there literally means crushed to power. Mm. That does not sound good. Lord, don't crush my heart to powder. Don't crush me to powder. But it's like, well, before I can make clay out of you, I need to do that. 
And he says, I live, I inhabit eternity, I live in these high places, I'm, 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 I'm God, and yet I will dwell in the heart of the humble, of the contrite, the heart that's crushed to powder, the heart that is given over to God. Isaiah 66, 2, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. That word, trembleth, I think that's one word we're missing in our country today. Even in our spiritual institutions today. There is a way of treating God's word today that is so sad to see. It's putting God's word on the same level as other books, other philosophies, other ideas, other psychologies. And there's no trembling yeah. before the word of God. Irreverence before God's word. Mm -hmm. Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Right. So God's first work is he's, he hates pride. And so he deals with this first, and James 4, 6 says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And then that's the verse that we were working on today in this game, Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, these things that the Lord hate, yea, even seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. So the first on God's list, on his hate list, is pride. A proud look. And it's interesting that pride is the root of every other sin. Mm -hmm. Earlier in my walk with the Lord, I did not understand that there are root issues and there are fruit issues. And oftentimes the fruit issues are uglier to me. The manifestations of the root issues, they seem what oftentimes in religion people want to remove. Right. But it never gets to the root. Right. right. So if we have a congregation where everybody is modestly dressed, where all the right standards are met, where people are learning scripture, memorizing and praying, and everything is good, then we are good. And that's further than we can be from the truth. That's right. That's just a illusion of goodness. Mm -hmm. But what's at the root of it? There, there's a group of uh, people that we deal with, uh, people who are transgender or um, who are given over to this perversion and other things. To me, for a long time, I could not handle like witnessing to these people. I, I didn't think that they were, I knew theologically that in Corinthians as such were some of you, but you have been cleansed and all of that. And to me, it was just so difficult. It was like, I, I don't want to deal with that. I don't, I don't think I, I'm, I'm willing to share the gospel with these people. Until God began to put me in situations where these people, at one point, I was in a patient's room, and, and this person asked me some spiritual questions. Good. And I was forced to sit down and share the gospel with this person. <laughs> and I was shocked after I shared the gospel with this person. As I was leaving the room, she was asking which passage of Romans does God talk about these areas in sin? Mm. And, then, and then seeing the Lord work through that, and God began to do something on my heart where it's like, Lord, I've, I've written these people off, but you haven't. Praise the Lord. And the interesting thing is dealing with another situation right now where a person who is in this, I would say wickedness, in this sin, it's horrific sin, and yet this person sits down and he says, I'm listening. Basically waiting to hear the gospel as we started a conversation, got interrupted by a call light, by a patient call, but then came back and this co-worker sitting there and says, yeah, continue. Giving full heart and ears to hear this, this gospel message. And God began to show me that the fruit is ugly. The fruit is very ugly. But the root doesn't seem so ugly. But really the, the, the root of the fruit is just independence. 
It's, I did not have a relationship with my father, with my mother. Some, oftentimes it can be that. And just independent spirit from God. I want to do what I want to do. But then when you deal with areas of satisfaction, other things, they, they, they throw their head down because they realize there's no satisfaction in all those things. Mm. Because they still are left empty. They are just hunting for things to be satisfied with. And at the point when they come where there's nothing else that they can try, whether it's extreme sports, whether it's relationships, whether it's anything else I'm dealing, not just with this particular sin, but with so many others, a person comes to a point where he realizes that there's nothing he's left with, and many people commit suicide at that point. Yeah. Right. And you wonder why you have fame, you have wealth, you have a lot of things, but you don't have satisfaction, because satisfaction doesn't come from any of those experiences. Right. It comes from God in heaven. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> This short es- uh, excerpt from a book titled God is More Than Enough spoke to me um, at one point in my life. It was authored by Jim Burke. He was once dean of students at Bob Jones University. I may have read this before, but at one point the Lord spoke to my heart through this. And he, we're dealing here with these root issues. We're talking about the fruit, but there is pride most often at every root of every fruit of sin. There are others. There is this selfishness and independence and all of that. It doesn't sound as bad as when you deal with other sins that are at the at the fruit that are manifested. But he talks about pride in this way: pride whines and pouts, mm-hmm. pride shouts and demands, pride argues and debates, pride covets and grasps, pride screams and retaliates. Pride shifts blame and points fingers. Pride lusts and indulges. Pride manipulates and schemes. Pride drives and obsesses. Pride worries and frets. Pride is full of self-assertion, self-protection, self-promotion, self-confidence, and self-esteem. Pride cries out, I will not, I must have, I don't have to, I won't let that happen, I can't take any more of, I don't like this. And those are all voices of pride. And if I'm not mistaken, we've all heard them. (laughs) Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this exercise God used to commit my heart every time that there is that issue in my soul, God brings me back to realize this is what it is. You may be thinking you're dealing with worry, or you may be thinking you're dealing with lust, or you may be thinking you're dealing with this. You're actually dealing with pride. That's the root. There's a problem there. There's a problem of independence. There's a problem of selfishness. There's a problem that's on the inside that's not manifesting itself. And the other things, they may appear to be ugly, and we want to remove it. All, unfortunately, what can happen is that a person can be just hacking away at the fruit. He's just removing the fruit, but it grows back on. He's mm-hmm. removing the fruit, but it grows back on. And what needs to be dealt with is the root. Mm-hmm. There's a root issue. So if we look at Deuteronomy chapter 8 again, we can ask this question, how did God humble his people in the wilderness? So the two pressures, the two things that God was doing there, was he was humbling them, but he was also testing them and proving them. And if we look and say, and what did God do in And can we see God doing that in our lives? How did God humble his people in the wilderness? And the first one is he deals with with here is that he humbled me. Verse 3, And suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And then verse 16 in the same chapter says, Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. It's interesting that he humbled them by giving them not what they wanted, but what they needed. They had appetites. And we all do here. And it's interesting when... um, Fasting is so foreign today. But even when you're at a place where you don't have your regular foods, those who either travel or those who go, you realize how strong your appetites are. <laughs> when you begin to crave that steak or you begin to, to crave that salad or whatever it may be, it's like, or that coffee, 
I mean, it, you realize there are some strong, deep-rooted appetites, and they had developed a taste for this delicious food. It was readily available in the land of their captivity, and they, at one point, were grumbling in their hearts, and they were talking about the, the melons and the leeks and the garlic and the fish and the meat that they had there. So they, they had these appetites, these desires, and these cravings. And it was their unrestrained appetites that caused many of them to die in the wilderness. So God gave them not what they wanted, but what they needed. And when you read the description of this manna, it was like fresh oil. Who likes fresh oil here? Maybe once in a while to dip your bread in if you're at an Italian restaurant and have some seasoning with it. But if you're having fresh oil from day to day to day, and they're and the taste of it, I'm not talking about that they were drinking oil, but um, the taste of it was like fresh oil. It might, might be good at first, might be good for a couple of few days, but after a while, like this is the only thing we have in front of our faces, and they begin to hate it. <laughs> They're like, we want the garlic, we want the, the meat, we want the fish, we want those tasty foods. But they, they, were so, they were given over to those appetites, and God humbled them by giving them not what they wanted, but what they needed. Mm-hmm. And there's things in our hearts that we may have desires in my heart, maybe yours too, for certain things. But God doesn't give those things, because he knows exactly what every soul needs, because he's that potter shaping that clay. He's knowing, he knows what to do. Number two, how did God humble his people in the wilderness? Is he allowed them to be hungry and to be thirsty? It's interesting that in our society here, if, if those who have a young children or you know your children start going hungry or thirsty, or you're at a place where you can't get enough water, there some tensions begin to rise. You begin to have emotions. I remember um, being uh, in North Carolina when we were there, and we were in South Carolina staying with family at one point. Uh, they came over to visit, and 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 you guys may not have experienced it here, but it, you might remember on the news they had that um, that shutdown of all that gas, of the, all that what um, the the the, um, the gas industry. So all over the parts of the East Coast, there there was a shut down. It was on our vacation. We went with our family who came to stay with us, and we didn't we didn't know if we'd get back home or not because we didn't have anywhere to, to fill up our, our gas. And so we were running low. And I remember it was my wife's birthday. And we were driving around on her morning of her birthday when we were supposed to be enjoying our time together, trying to find gas, and just thinking how people like on the news you see people become animals. They start, you know, fighting over this gas. They start hoarding it. They bring big tanks of, and fill it up. And the question is, when there's need, when there are concerns, when there's a pressure on, it's like, well, it's easy to, in a comfortable environment, to look at them and to judge them, to say, well, they were unspiritual. But when you're in the wilderness and you have children who are young and they need to drink and they, there's no water, there is a lot of emotion that begins to come up. And God was allowing them to be hungry and to be thirsty. But we know he's a good father. And Jesus did say, you know, that if your son asks you for bread, you don't give him a stone. But he allowed them to go through a period of hunger and thirst. And the hunger and thirst are the most basic and strongest of human desires. And so they were tested. They were humbled. And the circumstance in which the nation could not meet their most basic needs was designed by God to cause them to see the reality of their total dependence on him. And that reality produces humility. It's like, Lord, if you don't provide for us water, and he did. If you don't provide for us food, and he did, we will not make it in this wilderness. So that realization that, God, I am dependent today upon your grace. Like, I don't see when that manna falls on the, because we're still asleep. When the dew falls on the ground and the manna falls on top of that. And they didn't see it, but yet they knew that they're dependent on God. And some of them, rebels at heart, did not like that dependence. They wanted to run their own life. They wanted to do their own thing. So God was giving them not what they wanted, but what they needed. He was allowing them to experience some difficulty and some pressures because he was creating dependency in them. Maybe 
Maybe somebody here today is going through some trial or experiencing and your needs, maybe your basic needs aren't being met. And there could be some negative emotion. And God sees that. And it's amazing that David comes to God oftentimes in, in Psalms and he pours out his negative emotion. But that's not where he leaves it. He finds God in that experience. Right, right. Number three, how did God humble uh, his nation? Is by keeping life simple for them. So it is human nature to desire more things. But it's interesting that they didn't have malls or supermarkets to go and buy new clothes or new things or new gadgets in the wilderness. They didn't have that. So God really kept life simple for them. But it's a miracle that he protected the things they had. Their clothes did not become old. And God did warn them that there will come a time when there will be a great blessing that he will give to them. We read verse 10 through 14, and he warns them of this. When we were married, I remember our pastor read this passage on our wedding day. When thou hast eaten, verse 10, chapter 8 of Deuteronomy, and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, and not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwelt therein, and when the, thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So again, independence. I can do this myself. I have the resources. I have the means. And that root issue begins to fester. And then there are fruits of that root issue. And I know that we all believe here and understand that's the root issue of America today. That's the root of issue of our country. The prosperity and the wealth have brought about all the other problems that we right. deal with because we are now independent of God. We can do things without God. Yeah. So in a sense, their blessings from God will become their greatest threat if they don't have a heart of humility, if they don't continue seeking God with their all, all their heart. But also the problem with America today is that we've received this modern idea. It wasn't like this before, but this modern idea of the American dream. Hmm. It goes opposite to biblical truth. When I began to realize that, I, it was shocking to me because the American dream is almost, it's, it's virtuous. It's glorious. It's biblical, isn't it? <laughs> like to me, it, it was the Bible. I mean, we, you know, you, you listen to many pastors today preaching. The American dream is, is, is in scripture. There's a verse about it. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you kind of see it that way. But when you realize that that's actually antithetical to the gospel, it's not the truth. Then you begin to realize that that mentality, which focuses on you being the author of your future, you becoming a success in life, you getting what you crave, you getting what you desire, you getting satisfied with whatever it is through your hard labor, through the opportunities. I don't want to be disbalanced here. I'm grateful for what America was founded on. And I'm grateful for the opportunities we have in this land. And it's a blessing that I experience, my family experiences, and all of us here experience. But I think the focus of seeking it and pursuing it is very independent of God. Mm. And it creates the issues that we now deal with today. So this abandonment of God through covetousness, through rebellion, through pride has destroyed this nation. It's true. I have to ask my, myself this question. Am I content with a simple life? Or are there things that are tugging at me of this world that I absolutely have to have? So God's purpose for the wilderness experience was first to humble them. He humbled them in those three things that we looked at. But the second purpose was to prove them. It was to test his people. And Psalm 139, 23 through 24, we heard um, uh, Pastor Mears preach this before. David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So the question is, did David believe that God did not know what was in his heart? 
after he goes in through the, the whole length of the psalm, talking about, you know, my uprising and my sitting down, you know, you're on the right and on the left, and you're before and, and behind, you're everywhere, you're everything, you know everything about me. And then he goes into this and says, search me, O God, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. We know that David is asking for God to test him that he would not be deceived about himself. As we heard before, that he would enter those areas with God and that he would see what is in, is in his own heart. Those experiences are not to develop us and to say, now we are strong in and of ourselves. The experiences of the wilderness, the, the painful experience that David went through, were in order to show us that we can't without God. To bring us closer to needing God and to be dependent on God. It's interesting that when, uh, I don't know if anybody's put a vessel into the kiln. Anybody's put a vessel into the kiln, into the fire. So what do you do before, after it's done, you take that, what do you call that string, that, that metal string you, you cut? What's that? Yeah, but you, you, you cut it, um, you, you remove the vessel from the, from the wheel, and then you place it to do what? To dry. And what's the purpose of the drying process? To gain strength. What's the other purpose? Um, I guess to make permanent the progress. To, to make permanent the progress. The kiln will make it permanent. Like you can't do anything with that after it goes to the kiln. But to make it closer to be, being permanent, yes. What else? What is the other reason for the drying process? Try it. To try it. Because once it's drying, mm -hmm. you can find if there are cracks, if there is some deformity, if there is some issue there. Yep. And once it's dried, you can crack that thing and you can reabsorb it with water and you can make another vessel. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't go through the testing process of drying, you may put something in the kiln and it has a hole in it, or it has a crack in it. And then that's not going to be a good vessel for use. And so sometimes God puts, proverbially, us on a shelf and in, in your drying. And there's no, there's nothing happening. And it's like, Lord, I want off the shelf, I want to be in the kiln. I want to, well, maybe you don't want to be in the kiln, because that's pretty, that's, 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 that's dramatic in itself. But the idea that God has to put you in here, and, then, and you're just sitting drying. And, that, and that's to test and to prove what is in there, what is in the heart. Are there any cracks there? Are there any issues there that I need to fix before we go into the last stage of preparation here? And so the question is, do I know what is in my heart? I would say it's hard to say. We know to a certain extent. Do you know what is in your heart? There are many cracks that we don't know about. There are many issues that we might not know about. And the beautiful thing is that God knows. And if and just I'm just thinking, like if God were just to take and reveal all those issues, I think mean, we all I would get so discouraged, I would probably quit. So he takes it out of one thing at a time. Yeah. Like I'm not gonna show you the full picture of your heart because you can't handle it. And I know how I'm gonna guide you, I know what I'm gonna do in order to prepare you to see those things and then in order to deal with those things, because I'm gonna be dealing them with them, not you. Good. But if I were to see all of it at one time, and God knows we can't handle that. Right. So he gives things at a time and to show the things of the heart, those deep-rooted things, those maybe deep-rooted lies, maybe the deep-rooted things that um, we believe. <clears throat> I was um, knew a brother in a church uh, once, and had great fellowship with him, and it was just a great experience. And then he had to move out for work to a different city, quite a few, many hours from where we live. He was, before he had to move out for work, he was surrounded with great accountability, family, ministry, great things. And it was interesting that when he came back, I noticed some change in him. He was a lot more humble, more genuine. Like, I could sense the power of God in his life. And I was wondering what, what's, you know, why, why the change? And then you know, talking to him, he shared that going away, God had to bring him through experience to say, when you're alone and you're not surrounded by your accountability partners, 
when you're alone and you're not surrounded by a good church family, when you're alone and you have other things that you're doing, he was being tested. And what he saw in himself was his vulnerabilities and his weaknesses. Yeah. And that's what caused him to be humble. It was a testing time for him. And when he went through that testing time, he came back with a different perspective that I can't do this myself, that I need God for my own life and from to be fruitful. And it's beautiful that God, even though he sees the heart, he still loves us so dearly. Like there's no one in the world, in the universe, that loves us so much, even though he knows everything about us, the things we don't know about ourselves. That's the comforting thing, is that he's, he's our father, and he's our eternal father. Amen. He sees the motives that stain our best of our works. He sees the tendencies to stray away from him like we sung, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, Lord. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. That's all we can ask. God, would you take that heart? Because from day to day, there's this proneness. He knows the potential hurt we could cause others if we were just left to ourselves. And he still guides us and leads us through that. And this is why in his love, he wants us to see the reality of who we are, that we are dependent on him and nothing else. That there's no assumption of personal strength or idea of personal ability and independence from God. So we talked about how God humbled his people, but how did he test and how did he prove his people? If you... Type the word prove in a search engine, maybe on um, whatever website you use for studying scripture, you will see that there's a few passages in the Bible that deal with that. There's probably three or four that I've found, four specifically, that deal with this. And it's interesting that God tested their obedience to his word when he gave them clear instructions to collecting manna every day. So when he told them that, he gave them clear instructions how to do it, and he said he did it specifically to prove them. Okay, I give you my word, will you obey it? Now you know my guidance, now you know my instructions. And some of them went out in the wrong times, they picked too much, because they were proven, and they, in their heart they were found independent of God. I can do my own thing, and whatever God says, I'll just do it my way. So that was the first way God proved. And the second way, he tested their faithfulness by revealing himself to them on Mount Sinai. So he revealed his, himself and then he did it to prove, to see, would they follow his commandments or no after that. So the beautiful thing is, and we can, I'm not going to go into all those verses, they're there. But the beautiful thing is that has God revealed himself to us at certain times in life where we were so sure that this was divine intervention, this was God, we, even the moment of salvation, that God had revealed himself to us. And yet there is a proving Am I going to continue to be faithful to the God I now see and the God I now know? And then God tested their reaction when they were under pressure, and that we read about in Deuteronomy 8. And the last thing that's really interesting that deals with this word prove is later on, after they would walk into, and he promised them this, after they would walk into the land uh, that God had promised them, was that he would allow other foreign nations to exist around them. And that was, again, to prove them, to test their love and their commitment when other nations would try to seduce them to idolatry and adultery. And so we're in a very adulterous and idolatrous nation. Mm -hmm. very much. And that's a testing ground for believers. That's proving our hearts, our commitment, and our love to God. So God is testing our obedience to his word, faithfulness to him through the revelation he gives, the reactions to pressures that we experience, and then ultimately the love and commitment to him by the culture we are in. So there are many things that the nation of Israel experienced that we experience today as an individual. And the last thing that I want to just address here is that what is the ultimate purpose of the wilderness experience? Anyone here uh, could say, what, what do you think is the ultimate purpose of the wilderness experience? To succeed. Change the heart. Change the heart. 
learn dependence on Christ. Say again. Everything about it was a test. Everything about it was a test. Was to kill the old man. To kill the old man. Amen. A vessel fit for the master's use. To create a vessel fit for the master's use. Mm -hmm. Amen. So the ultimate test is all of those things. Yep. The ultimate reason are all of those things, and to humble us and to test us for the purpose. I believe that I do believe, and I, I don't know. I do believe that when we receive Christ, we receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Right. That He lives in us. Amen. But there's something that has to happen for us to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Right. What is it something that has to happen? Why is it that God is guided, Jesus Christ is guided into the wilderness for 40 days, mm -hmm. but He comes out in the power of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. It's a, I, I believe it's a pattern to see that the wilderness is there to enable the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's when Moses knew he was not ready, when he went through 40 years in the desert, he knew that he cannot lead the nation. It's too big of a task for him. He knew that his reliance and his strength would only come from God. He was asking God not to send him there. So ultimately, the purpose is to create this dependence on God, this humility that you begin to see the reality that it is all God and it is not flesh. To enable and create the power of the Holy Spirit. And understanding that helps us as believers engage if we do go through wilderness experiences. To engage us and to understand the purpose behind them. Is so that the power of God may be manifested in our lives and we could touch others for his glory. As God does not waste hurt and he does not waste time, there's always a purpose that he has in mind. So going back to those two things, the potter and the clay, and then his nation in the wilderness, just to see that God applies specific pressure. He does specific things in order to deal with the heart, in order to create a vessel for his use and for his glory. But the beautiful thing of it all is that to, to know and to realize that his scarred hands, his nail-pierced hands are holding that clay. So he's holding us in his hand and he's doing it, and yet he's the one that suffered more than any one of us can suffer or experience any kind of pain. Mm -hmm. and he can relate to all of it and he was there crying to the Father, Lord, let this cup pass from me. And we can have different maybe ideas of what that prayer was, but there was pain involved. Yeah. There was blood on his brow. There was suffering. And through that, as a broken vessel, he just ushered life for all of us. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Can we pray? Yeah. yeah, let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to be here at camp, to enjoy your presence. Thank you for all the things you've shared with us in these few days we've been here together, God. Thank you for the spirit that is here, God, for the presence, for the reverence to your word, for the love of your word, Lord. Thank you for the revelations of your truth, God. I pray that you would create within us a humble heart and a contrite spirit that you could dwell in and fill and use us for your glory, Lord. I pray that there wouldn't be a spiritual amnesia to the things that you allow us to do, but it would be a true realization that true humility just follows understanding who you are and who each and every one of us is before you, God. It's not patterning our life after somebody else, and it's not comparing our lives to what we've been before. But Lord, seeing your beauty helps us see who we truly are, undeserving of your mercy and grace. And that gives the true reality and true understanding of we need you, God. And you are the good one. And you are the beautiful one. And you are the glorious one, Lord. And we ask that you continue to guide and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.